Are you ready to become an unstoppable force in Tarisland? In this video, we're revealing the ultimate tank builds for all three classes, Warrior, Paladin and Barbarian Fighter. These builds have conquered dungeons, raids, elite content and challenge modes. And now it's your turn to dominate. Welcome to the Tank Club. I'm TC Lee and today I'll guide you through the best tank builds to help you crush everything in your path in Taris Land. If you've got your own successful tank build, feel free to drop it in the comments below so that we can help the Taris Land tank community to thrive. We're going to be starting off by looking at stats and this information is crucial for your tank build as your stats directly impact your performance. The main priorities for tanking are resilience, stamina, focus, glancing, cooldown rate, and finally Omni. Now resilience is your immunity to being critically hit by enemies. It's essential because it helps you receive less damage. The required value varies depending on the boss and the level of content that you're tackling. A normal raid boss needs less resilience than the same boss on Elite. You can easily find this information by going to the gameplay menu. For example, you can select raid, and when on this screen, you can look at each raid and then look at the attribute menu. This will show you the current suggested attributes needed alongside what you currently have. And you can do this for each raid because every raid is different. So if we look at the current hardest raid in the game, we're currently on the right numbers for everything except for Omni and Cooldown. But Omni and Cooldown isn't an essential stat, but Glancing, Resilience and Gear Score are all very important. And as you can see, we're well within the resilience setup there. You can improve resilience with your stats on your gauntlet, leather gauntlet and accessory. So if you need more, obviously, as you can see here on the gauntlets, those specific gear slots can have resilience, but others can't. So these are the only pieces, the gauntlet, leather gauntlet and accessory. Another thing you can do is use blue gems with resilience, but this is pretty much the limit on how you can increase this stat. So it's very important that you do utilize this stat on those three gear slots and with some of your gems to reach the value, or else you're gonna find it very difficult against bosses when they are critically hitting you. Next, we have stamina, and this will increase your HP or your max health. There are no limits on how much HP you can have. So the more, the better. More HP allows you to absorb more damage from bosses, and boosting stamina can be done through gems, gear stats, inscribe stone. There are so many ways to increase this. Another reason why this is important is depending on your class, you might have some skills that will scale with max health. So for example, the warrior has multiple skills where they will heal you and the heal scales from whatever your max HP is. So it's very, very important, but like I say, it varies between class. Sometimes it's way more efficient to have even more because you will get bigger heals and things like that when it scales with HP. Next we have focus, and this will increase your physical defense when used by a tank. Focus does different stuff with different specializations. This is another crucial survival tool because it's always active. It's reducing each hit you take by the armor value. So having more armor is always gonna be beneficial. Then we move on to glancing. Glancing is the percentage chance that you have to reduce incoming damage by 25%. When glancing procs, it reduces damage by 25%. The soft cap on glancing chance is 42%. So you don't need to stack it excessively beyond that point as the benefits do diminish. So it will be harder to keep increasing it. You can increase it over 42%, but it takes a little bit more effort to do so. When we scroll down a little bit further in this, you can also enhance the glancing effect itself. So the base effect is 25% damage reduction, but it can actually be increased further by utilizing various things such as your inscribe stone. As you can see from this bit here, we're actually reducing it by 28.4% plus 11%. So it's actually a lot more than 25% damage reduction. Uh, next, we're looking at cooldown rate. This is vital for tanks as it decreases your global cooldowns, reduces skill cooldowns, and increases casting speed. This is highly beneficial since it allows you to refresh skills more quickly and maintain higher uptimes on damage shields, mitigation skills, and damage reduction effects. So it's really important, especially early on, to try and stack a bit of cooldown where you can as like the next priority after you've got all those defensives out the way. Finally, we've got Omni, which provides damage immunity, and it is a valuable stat to build up. However, you'll need to stack it above 1855 for it to be effective. 
so it's something to focus on later in the game when you have access to more inscribed stone energy maybe when you've increased your inscribed stone you can then look at putting more omni onto your gear to reach that 1855 threshold if you're not reaching 1855 it's generally quite ineffective and not super valuable to actually stack this up you're better off focusing into your glancing your resilience your stamina and your cooldown rate when it comes to gear all classes generally follow the same path you can actually check out my gear guide over on my website which breaks down how to get all the gear where it's obtained from what pieces to get that's going to be the best option but you generally complete elite raids to get the best gear and as new content unlocks you continuously upgrade your gear while waiting for some new raids you can do arcane realm to fill the gaps in with your gear the reason raid gear is so crucial is that raids drop gear sets and gear sets add additional stats onto your build for example with this barbarian gear set here you've got the frozen set and we are going to get many additional effects when we add three pieces five pieces and eight pieces of this gear together it's going to give us things like healing which is something that's missing from the barbarian skills so it is very very important if you were wearing regular gear from the arcane realm or dungeons it would have basic stats and possibly a special aptitude but it would not have these additional set benefits there is also a secondary set it's the sturdy set and this is basically a two-piece gear set where we will just gain increased glancing effect when we have two pieces slotted so there's three possible options we've got the neck the ring or the accessory can be slotted any two of those will give you this particular benefit another useful thing to pick up is the unique badge so you get this badge it's got haste effect plus three percent the only way to obtain this so by doing forest gemini you will obtain this particular badge and it's a really good one to get by doing arch druid raid as well you will also get a unique weapon which comes with this extra glancing effect so as you can see it's worth getting all these gear pieces you've got to get them because it's going to give you a lot of extra power when focusing on gear stats in the early phases of the game you want to focus on specific stats on your gear so the attributes the enchanted attributes that you want to have are stamina and glancing those are the two most important some gear pieces can't have these particular stats so in those cases use resilience but also you can consider cooldown or omni later down the line when you reach a certain amount of max health and you don't really need to focus on those stats as much you can use the tempering system to convert stats from some gear over to the gear that you're wearing so if you've got a set piece of gear and you've got a piece of dungeon gear that's got the stats on simply convert it over using the tempering system so that you can min max your build additionally you have gems and empowering most gear can either slot a gem or be empowered for gems focus on stamina for blue but do use resilience if you're under the resilience requirement for certain bosses use strength on red and use glancing on the yellow as you progress you might earn some colorful gems which can be switched in although you can only have one of each colorful gem slotting the colorful gem in the red slots will make you tankier but you will do less damage for empowering obviously start with stamina strength and focus stamina will fit into your helmet armor and greaves strength will go into your shoulder guards leather gauntlets and boots and then focus will go into your axe you can then upgrade these to intermediate the blue level if you've got the materials to do so as you progress on to being able to equip the purple quality i'm personally looking at things like specialization effect and focus for that extra resistances and then there's many many options in here such as reflecting damage health stealing so it's going to be good maybe to combine a few different ones of these because these are very very strong there's huge values health stealing effect plus 18 percent that's a big number alongside additional stamina so you've got many options at the moment obviously it's difficult to know which one is absolutely the best but things like reflecting damage health stealing specialization they're all very very useful for tanking special aptitudes are gear perks that affect your abilities they add additional effects to your abilities making them stronger and you can stack multiple of the same aptitude onto different pieces of gear there are four sets of different aptitudes which are applied to different gear pieces although the base of all of them are kind of the same it's the additional effects that are particularly powerful such as the bonuses during echo of destiny which might be by a huge percent my personal preference is to utilize special aptitudes that are used on skills with really short cooldowns generally your first three skills because this means they will be used much more often making them more valuable generally i target things that improve damage shields 
resistances and glancing with my special aptitude choices and this is what brings me to my recommendations. For Paladin tanks my personal recommendations are to use Holy Shield Bash aptitudes on accessories, greaves and helmet. This is to buff up your physical defense with 6% more during Echo of Destiny and then Flying Shield on all other gear pieces to buff up the shield effect significantly of that skill. For Barbarian tanks we go with Frost Cross on the shoulder guards, ring and belt as triggering Echo of Destiny increases damage reduction of the next Frost Cross by 70% and that's per piece so if you've got it in all three pieces that's a lot. Then we use Chill Strike on accessories, greaves and helmet for a big chunk of extra physical defense which is increased by 32% during Echo of Destiny per piece of gear that this is on. Then finally I use Frost Strike on all other pieces for the additional shield absorption with an extra buff when triggering Echo of Destiny once again. Finally the Warrior we use Shield Assault on the accessories, greaves and helmet for an increased glancing level and a buff to Shield Assault's effect by 5% per piece during Echo of Destiny. Then we go with Shield Bash on weapons, gauntlet, neck, boots and badge to buff up the physical defense and Sturdy Barrier on everything else to gain additional shield absorption with a chance to increase the shield effect by 76% during Echo of Destiny per piece of gear that this aptitude is on. So these are my general recommendations for special aptitudes. Moving on to the Inscribed Stone system. This system is very important to give you a lot of additional power with your build. It does take a very long time to max this out however, you can actually input a hundred different nodes. But this will take a lot of time, you'll have to play the game on a daily basis and do your daily tasks. And so it's going to be hard for me to tell you an exact best in slot in Scribestone. But I'm going to give you a few tips on how you should build this out as you progress based on what I've been doing myself with my own in Scribestone on my tank builds. So the first thing is when selecting nodes for your in Scribestone system, start by placing just one point into each node to advance further upwards inside the in Scribestone. This approach is more efficient since the first point in a node provides more stats compared to the second and third points. At the very beginning, focus on progressing up one side of the inscribe system. You need to prioritize the essential stats such as stamina, cooldown, focus, specialization and effects, and unlocking emblem slots. The first priority is unlocking all five emblem slots. This is because when you slot an emblem, you'll gain additional effects, but also emblems will give you additional stats. When you level up emblems, they become significantly more powerful at higher levels, and they can be leveled up to level 10. This strategy will help you maximize your build's effectiveness early on. Once you've unlocked all five emblem slots, focus on unlocking the core nodes, as these enhance your Fatuina Echo, which offer strong benefits. The Fatuina Echo is something that will proc automatically, when you are attacking the enemy, you'll build up stacks and then it will activate and it will give you the benefits that are provided by these core nodes. Once you've unlocked all your core nodes, pick up all the other useful nodes, especially those with stamina, cooldown, focus, specialization attributes and effects. And you want to try and get one point into all of these nodes. As you are progressing your inscribed stone, make sure to pay close attention to any of the nodes that you see a bonus plus 50%. This plus 50% bonus comes from your emblems. So emblems can be leveled up as they level up. They can provide a bonus of stats to different other nodes nearby. With these 50% bonuses, you want to increase these to level two or three. You need to put special attention into leveling up specialization attribute and effects as well. Once you've kind of got one point into everything, once you've unlocked all your emblems, once you've got your core nodes, once you've got all your 50% bonuses maxed out, then you want to start enhancing the nodes around your core nodes. So the core will attach to nearby nodes. The level of these nearby nodes levels up your core. So your core can be level three, but all of the nodes around it that are attached to it will need to be level three as well. So you want to do that next because that will boost up your core nodes to provide stronger benefits via the Fatuina Echo. Finally, you fill out the nodes that provide other useful stats to finish things off. And you want to focus things that you're really lacking. If you lack health, put more into stamina. If you want to be able to cast skills more frequently, put them into cooldown. Add points into Omni as well as you start getting higher level. Add in some focus 
to reduce your incoming damage. When we look at emblems, so there are five emblem slots that you can use. There are a specific five emblems that I like to use on all my classes. These include Barrier Guard, Warlike Surge, Reversal, High Energy Potion, and Potential. I also sometimes like to switch in Tribal, but those are generally the ones I like to use for all my builds. Now it's the emblem perks that are important here. So, so each emblem has randomly generated perks that you gain as you upgrade the emblem. Some perks where you get things like plus 12 stamina or plus one attack are not very beneficial. So you might need to upgrade multiple emblems of the same type to get one good one or get one that is like a best in slot emblem. Now the key perks that you wanna focus on or any that give plus 50% stat increases. So if you give a plus 50% stat increase to a nearby node, that's gonna to equate to more than 12 stamina. So obviously that's much more important than having stats on your emblems. And having these plus 50% bonuses, especially when you have multiple of them, will significantly enhance your overall stats. The other key perk will be the plus one emblem level. This increases the power of the emblem itself. So each emblem has an effect Increasing it by one will increase the amount of percentage or the power that it does, making your emblems more effective. To maximize your build, aim to upgrade emblems that have only these two types of bonuses. By focusing on these perks, you can ensure that your tank build is as powerful and efficient as possible. Next, we're gonna look at ultimates, and ultimates can be kind of utilized in a very specific way, so you always want to use the single target taunt. So every class has this single target taunt, definitely always use that one in all tank build situations that's the best one now if we're thinking arcane realm dungeons and that kind of content the next best thing is going to be to use a speed boost so we've got beast spirit here it's going to increase your movement speed this is really useful for dungeon and arcane realm kind of content and very very now and again in, in raids so that would be my second preference and then for dungeon content it is having an interrupt there are multiple bosses within the dungeon content that will require being interrupted. So this is my standard setup for dungeon and arcane realm. When we move on to raids, it kind of varies then. You then want to slot your AOE taunt because there will be situations where add spawning and AOE taunting is necessary, but not always. And then it is really kind of a mixture between is the space that you need to run. So in the very first raid, the Shadow Witch, there are ad pools at one end of the room and then the other and then the other and you're running about a bit. So that's when the sprint becomes really useful. But there are some times where you don't really need to move at all and you can stay in the very center of the room, at which point this isn't really useful. So I do vary in raid content between slam and the speed boost and every single class has these same skills. They're just called something different. So every class has a speed boost, every class has an interrupt and every class has both of these taunt skills. So just mix these around, but yeah, generally, for raids, I will always go with single target taunt, AoE taunt, and then movement speed or slam, depending on if there's an interruptible. And then for dungeons, it's getting rid of that AoE taunt and just using those three. Next, we're gonna quickly look at consumables. Now there's a few different things. Obviously, number one is your healing potions. So you really need to have these available. Always make sure you're carrying a lot of these because if you take a big hit, the healer's going to struggle to heal you up. You're going to need to do something to help recover that so that the healer doesn't get burnt out, doesn't end up with all their skills on cooldown, and you're healed up to full ready for the next big hit because if you take two or three back-to-back -back big hits, you're probably going to be dead. So you always want to be having plenty of healing potions to help out with that healing. The next thing you can use is fish. Now, these can be caught by just fishing, and these aren't super beneficial, but you've got some little things in there, like this one here, damage reflection, plus 2% for five minutes. So it's only 2% but it's something else. Um, you've got things like lifesteal 1% for five minutes, things that can actually buff up your, so Omni points plus 12. So these are worth using because they're gonna give you little benefits. And it's worth just getting them because you're gonna gain them from fishing. Just pop them before you go into a fight. You can use them in combat as well. You can end up using multiple effects because obviously the cooldown, the cooldown isn't five minutes, but the effect lasts for five minutes. So that means you can just use those. Another important thing is boost potions. So there's a variety of different ones. Obviously the first initial one that you might look at is this one, the shield potion. You're gonna be able to use this alongside healing potions as well. So defense is increased, glancing chance is increased, but it's only for a very short window of 10 seconds. It is worthwhile considering other options as well, such as increased damage, even on a tank, because outputting more damage is gonna help your group to clear content a little bit faster. And then the final consumable that you can really use is food. Now, the annoying thing about food is it was only available during the food festival, but there's a few different options on food. 
So you've got all of these different things. One will increase your max HP. One of them will increase your glancing. And then you've got like the premium stew, which will increase stats for your group. So it's a group buff that your group can use this. So when you use this, it will place it down for your group to be able to use. And it's a very defensive option. So this will give your group more defense. If you're struggling for survival, if people aren't staying alive, it could be really, really helpful. However, I wouldn't be wasting these on content that's not challenge mode raids because it's just not worth it. If you're using these and it's not a challenge mode raid because you can't get these at the minute. The event isn't currently on. You can't craft the food. So it is very limited and we don't know when it'll be coming back. So I wouldn't waste this on content that you can get through without it. Okay, now we've took care of all of those kind of general basics. We're going to look at each individual class. Okay, so the skills that we have on the Barbarian Fighter include Chill Strike, Frost Cross, Frost Strike, Axe Cyclone, Death Fight, and Frost Outbreak. Now, Chill Strike, as you can see, this is a very much a spammable skill. So the way these skills work, we've got Chill Strike, 2.8 seconds. We've got our Frost Cross here, 9.4 seconds. We've got Frost Strike, 7.5 seconds. So these are our short cooldown skills. We've then got our AoE skill, which is Axe Cyclone, and then we've got Death Fight, and Frost Outbreak, which are kind of burst, long cooldown skills that we're not going to be using very often. So you've got to really save these for crucial, crucial moments of fights. If we look at the talents, now this build, like I say, has functioned very well in all content so far. I'm using three points into Combat System. I'm using two points into Frozen Mastery, three points into Piercing Chill, three in Ice Thread Rune. We've got three into Pain Res, one point into Frost Cross. This actually converts Storm Flying Axe as a skill into a different skill, Frost Cross. So that's why we don't want to use Storm Flying Axe on anything. We're using Frost Cross instead. We've then got Frost Reaction, three points. Three points into Chill Strike Plus. Three points into Frost Strike Plus. We've got two out of two in Frost Bind. Three points in Frost Cross Plus there. Three points into Frost Spread. And that completes the talent tree. So the general rotation for this build would be using Frost Strike as we first go into combat. We then follow that up with a Frost Cross and then Chill Strike. The reason why we do this, we use Frost Strike to gain those Frozen Runes. We then use Frost Cross because that actually drops the cooldown of Frost Strike. So it reduces the cooldown. But then Chill Strike reduces the cooldown of Frost Cross. So you use one after the other after the other and then you can go back to recasting Frost Strike again. Now, if Frost Strike is on its cooldown, you try to use Frost Cross. If Frost Cross is on cooldown, you use Chill Strike. So although it's not like a set rotation, depending on which one is on cooldown, you always cast the next skill along to reduce the cooldown of the prior ones. And that is just how you rotate it. In between that, you can use Axe Cyclone for increased damage. And if you want add pulls, this is always the first skill that you want to use. So you always use Axe Cyclone first when going into add pulls because this, this instantly AoE aggros everything. And without taunting it, you'll just gain aggro. So for dungeon content, this is absolutely essential. And then you do save Death Fight and Frost Outbreak for emergency. So it increases your physical defense, you gain damage immunity. The lower the HP that you have, the higher the damage immunity. So you cast this when you're in a very, very critical situation because it has an 84 second cooldown. So you don't want to waste it for nothing. Frost Outbreak is going to activate Frost Energy, improving your glancing chance by 15%, increasing the glancing effect by 10%. Physical defense is increased and Frozen Runes slowly for 8 seconds. So it's going to give you a lot of kind of benefits but it's going to have a super long cooldown. So avoid using it unless you're in a real critical situation. Moving on to the Paladin. And with the Paladin, we've got Holy Hammer. We've got Holy Shield Bash. We've got Flying Shield. We've got some Holy Fire, Holy Regent, and Ardent Guardian. In our talent tree, we use three points in Divine Body, three into Mental Focus, three into Holy Hammer Plus, three into Returning Shield, one point into Holy Shield Bash, replacing that Holy Sword skill. We then use Thermal Recovery, three points into there, three into Fast Recharge, three into Flying Shield Plus, two into Guardian Shield, two into Holy Regen Plus, three into Aegis Plus, and then finally three into Heart of Fire. Now with the Paladin, it is really important to make sure you stack up stamina, because as you can see on the gear, Holy Regen additionally recovers HP, restores HP. Every time you use Flying Shield, you recover HP. This will scale. So these skills restore HP. When you look at Flying Shield, this will give you a damage shield, which is scaled based upon your max HP. Whenever we see percentages, so this will increase physical defense. So the higher our focus, the more physical defense we'll get from using Holy Shield Bash. So there's lots of different implications here. With the Paladin, the rotation starts with Holy Fire. So this is actually part of your rotation. And if you are using enough cooldown, then you can use this on cooldown. So 
Once you've cast this, we then move on to Flying Shield. This gives you a damage shield to protect you. Very, very valuable. Then you use Holy Shield Bash to give yourself physical defense and do damage. This is also a group attack and it will bounce between targets. And then finally you use Holy Hammer, which will increase your glancing chance. So you use those skills in that order generally. When we look at the Spectrum Energy here, so you earn Aegis Energy by glancing enemies' attacks or with time. Consume 100 Aegis Energy to enchant Flying Shield. So Flying Shield will become enhanced, so it'll be lit up. And that is even more critical to use that once that is the case. In Scribestone State, so once this is kind of casting any other skill than Flying Shield within 6 seconds resets the cooldown of Flying Shield. So that is kind of generally the rotation you go for, and then Holy Regen will give you a burst heal. So you don't want to use this when you don't need to, and it's based upon your max HP. So again, it's important that we have a good amount of max HP from stacking up our stamina, because we're going to get a bigger heal depending on that. And then also when we look at Ardent Guardian, reduces the damage taken, increases physical defense. So it does two things. So these are two critical skills that you need to use. Obviously use this for big damage, apply it to an enemy, especially bosses as they're about to do a big hit. And then obviously use Holy Regen, save that for when you need to heal. Finally, we've got the Warrior. Now the Warrior is probably my least favorite of all of the classes. I don't really know why. I just really like the Barbarian for dungeon content. I really like the Paladin for raid content. With the Warrior, you've got Shield Bash, you've got Shield Assault, Sturdy Barrier, We've got Storm Trample, Last Stand, and Impenetrable. Now, if we look at these again, we have actually got things in here that are going to heal, and it's all based on that max HP. So again, really critical for the Warrior that you stack up your max HP, because many of the effects and your gear will be scaled on your max HP. So the heals and everything on this scale with that. It's very important to make sure you're stacking it up. So with your talents, there's two options. You've got the glancing option and you've got the healing option. This is my preferred option, but don't you don't have to take these because there is an alternative way to play the warrior tank. Now, my preference is three points into bruised, three points into defense master, three into commander, three into core sustainer, one point into double shield, three points into sturdy barrier plus, five points into shield assault plus, two points into counter shield, three points into shield bash plus, three into multiple barrier, and then three into indomitable. What this does is this creates a glancing effect where you've got really high glancing chance. There you go, you've got glancing effect there in your passives, you've got various different things kicking off there. So it makes it so that you are able to dodge. It increases your glancing rate, it increases your dodge rate. So it's all about trying to take as little damage as possible, but you do lose some self healing. Now the tough part about a warrior is they have like an additional resource requirement. So where the others may basically run on cooldowns and then will proc certain skills based on their specialization energy. With the warrior, you've actually got toughness. So when you look at your skills here, you've got, it costs AP 30, it's got a cooldown. This costs AP and it's got a cooldown. This costs toughness and it's got a cooldown. So you do actually have to use skills to build up your toughness. So you'll need to use shield bash, which gives toughness and you need to use shield assault and then this will give you enough toughness to cast Sturdy Barrier. Now, the Warrior is incredibly high damage in AoE situations, especially compared to the other two classes because of Storm Trample. As you can see here, very busy skill, and it like reduces the cooldown, it gives you resilience, so even your AoE skill is giving you benefits that you'll need to use it on boss fights and other pieces of combat. So you'll use Storm Trample. Sturdy Barrier is like your emergency. It's going to give you a damage shield. Shield Assault is going to increase your resilience as well, it's going to give you that glancing chance. Shield Bash is going to increase your toughness and your physical defense. So the Warrior I find to be really awkward to play in terms of a rotation because they have that extra resource that they have to use. With Last Stand and Impenetrable, obviously again, you've got these skills where they are really long cooldowns, 85 seconds. This will boost your max HP and your HP will instantly be recovered. So this is a huge skill that gives you a ton of HP and healing. And then you've also got, it gives you a shield to protect you for the next 12 seconds, reducing damage taken. So the Warrior is a potentially good option, but it does require a bit more effort to play this class in comparison to the Barbarian and the Paladin. Okay, everyone, that is everything for this Taris Land Tank build video. Obviously, if you've got any questions, let me know in the comments below. You can also hop on over to the Tank Club Discord if you've got any questions or queries or want to talk about tanking any further. Thank you very much to all of our patrons, our YouTube members, and all the subscribers for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>